to start. Uh, and uh, uh, thank you everybody for attending my talk. My name is uh, Fabio Falzoi. I work uh, at Devil as a senior software engineer, and uh, we are going to talk a little bit about uh, Go Garbage Collection. Uh, specifically, I'll introduce briefly memory management in Go. Then uh, we'll see a little bit about uh, the theory of garbage collection and uh, the specific Go garbage collection algorithm. And finally, we'll uh, briefly speak about uh, the performance impact of GC uh, on your Go applications. Okay, let's start from, uh, from memory management. Uh, first of all, unlike uh, C, C++, uh, uh, when uh, you are uh, writing your Go programs, uh, you can't explicitly, explicitly decide where to allocate objects. Uh, Go uses an, uh, an optimization, uh, and the escape analysis, uh, to decide where to allocate objects, on the stack or on the heap. And uh, escape analysis uh, tries its best to allocate on the stack, since uh, stack allocations are considered to be cheaper compared to heap allocations. But to do that, uh, the size and lifetime of the object must be known at compile time. Uh, another thing important to, to say is that uh, escape analysis rules are not part of Go language specification. So mm, instead of try to guessing, uh, even if there are some common patterns that lead to heap allocations, uh, it is better to ask the compiler, and you can do that with, uh, with this command. OK. Uh, let's talk a little bit about stack and stack allocation. Uh, stack is managed in frames. What is a frame? A frame is uh, an individual memory space for each function call. Uh, creating a new frame and uh, invalidating uh, the frame when the function returns is just a matter of uh, bumping up or down the value of a register, the stack pointer register. So let's see an example. We are in the main function here, and uh, we have the frame for the main function, and on that uh, stack frame we allocated the x variable, and here this line uh, is representing the, val the current value of the stack pointer register. All, th all, all of the memory that are beyond that line uh, is considered not to be, not to be valid. So, uh, when, uh, when uh, we call the f function, a new frame is allocated, and to do that, uh, the, the stack pointer register is simply bumped down, and uh, here the y, the y variable is allocated. When the f function returns, uh, we modify again the stack pointer register, so we logically delete uh, the frame for the f function. OK, uh, we, know, we all know that uh, typical Go application can have a lot of Go routines. Uh, we, are, we are talking about uh, ten, even tens of thousands of Go routines, and each Go routine has its stack. Uh, it is crucial for the performance of, of, the, Go, uh, of the Go applications to, uh, to, s to start with a stack that is uh, quite small, 2 kilobytes in fact for uh, AMD64 uh, uh, architecture, but that stack uh, can be grown dynamically. It is dynamically resized. Specifically, uh, when, uh, when we do a function call, the runtime uh, inserts a prolog uh, and uh, it checks uh, the current size of the stack uh, and uh, the room that is needed to, uh, to create a new frame. If that, if, that side, uh, if that room is not enough, uh, the go runtime will uh, split the stack uh, and to keep it contiguous, we'll copy all the, all, uh, the old stack in a new stack, uh, in a new uh, chunk of memory that is greater. And also the pointer to the object allocated on the stack are uh, adjusted accordingly. And the same goes uh, uh, for uh, the stack shrink. Uh, when uh, the memory allocated for the current stack uh, is too much, uh, in fact, uh, when we are uh, using less than 25% of the current allocated memory, the stack is uh, shrinking uh, with the inverse, uh, the inverse process. OK, if, uh, uh, consider that uh, th the frame of the stack can, uh, can uh, add up uh, uh, a, a lot, of, a lot uh, if, you consider if, you, if you think about recursive function, we can have a lot of frames. And unlike uh, your C, C++ program, uh, here we are not limited to 8 kilobytes or so. Uh, go routine stacks uh, can are practically infinite. In fact, they are well uh, one gigabyte for uh, for AMD64 architecture. And uh, the fact is that the memory for the stack is allocated is backed on the Go heap. That's the the secret. If you uh, if you if you allow me to say that. Uh, well, uh, to allocate the stack, uh, there are two two, two allocation paths, and. Uh, if the stack we are locating is less than 32 kilobytes, then we have uh, a, a cache that is local to the processor uh, where we can allocate uh, that chunk of memory. Instead, when, uh, when uh, that cache is, uh, is empty or when we want to allocate a bigger stack, uh, 
we have to, uh, to rely on a global pool. Uh, this is an architecture that is, uh, that is made to reduce the contention. Okay, uh, I know that this image is quite frightening, but stick with me. Let's talk a little bit with, uh, about uh, IP allocations. First of all, this, uh, this kind of architecture is derived from the TC malloc for, uh, for those of you that are curious about that. And uh, the first thing to say is that uh, mm, Go allocates uh, uh, memory for object in spans, uh, using spans. A span, uh, you can see the, the, the span here, for example, is just uh, a run of memory pages uh, uh, where we can allocate, allocate object of a specific size. So we allocate object uh, in size classes. Go has, has uh, I think, uh, 67 size classes. And uh, uh, based on the size of the allocation we are doing on the heap, uh, you can uh, uh, you can use uh, a local cache of spans, uh, but if that cache is empty, uh, or if the size of the allocation you're requesting is greater again than uh, 32 kilobyte, you have to rely on a, on a central cache, on a central cache on the hem heap uh, structure. And uh, when the memory is not enough, the hem heap structure is the one responsible to asking more memory uh, uh, from to the kernel. Okay, so. If we compare the allocation paths for uh, GoRoutine user stacks uh, and then the heap, uh, we can say that the paths are quite similar. So, uh, at least to me, initially it was not so clear why stack allocation should be considered cheaper. The fact is that uh, it is not a problem of allocation, it's a problem of the allocation cost. Because, uh, as, we've, uh, as we've, we have seen, uh, the stack, uh, stack the allocation is very efficient because uh, we, can, uh, we can just uh, move the stack, pointer, uh, the stack pointer register value. Instead, uh, regarding the, heap, uh, the, the objects allocated on the heap, we need to rely on garbage collection. So, uh, the first thing, uh, uh, the first, the first thing you, you can say is that uh, we, should, we should give up uh, using Go if we are uh, looking for high performance applications. Well, in my opinion, and uh, luckily, luckily uh, not, not only mine, uh, as you can see from the tweet uh, over there, uh, no, this is not the case, at least uh, uh, for, the, for the majority of, of, of the case. First of all, garbage collection is very, very useful to protect ourselves from, from an entire class of memory errors, and especially memory leaks, that are really hard to debug and that can lead to out-of-memory errors for services that are up for a very long time. Besides, as, uh, as we will see in a minute, uh, Go garbage collection is optimized for very low latency with uh, a, a minimal impact on throughput. Okay, let's talk a little bit about uh, the main topic of, the, of, uh, of this talk. Uh, the, main, uh, the, the, the basic algorithm that uh, Go uses for garbage collection is mark and sweep. Mark and sweep is a very simple uh, uh, algorithm for garbage collection. It is uh, divided into two phases, the mark phase and the sweep phase. Uh, the mark phase uh, uh, starts from all the roots, uh, searching for uh, address of object allocated on the heap. When I say roots, uh, it, it means uh, global variables, uh, goroutine user stack variables, uh, and uh, mm, uh, variables uh, addresses to, to, to variables uh, that uh, stay on the data BSS section and so on. And uh, starting from that, we mark each reachable, reachable object that is on the heap, uh, and we mark it as alive. In the sweep phase, uh, we check uh, each allocated object and we reclaim uh, all the objects that, that are not marked uh, because those objects are uh, simply garbage. Okay, uh, a useful abstraction when we reason about the mark and sweep garbage collection is the tricolor mark and sweep. Uh, we, uh, we consider all the objects at, uh, at, the, marking, uh, starting at, at uh, the start of the marking to be white, to be in the white set. These are the objects that are not marked. Uh, as long as we mark the object, we first we mark them gray when we first uh, uh, land of on them, and finally we mark them black when all of their refer reference have been marked. So uh, you can see that doing, doing this process, the gray object advances like, like a wavefront. And uh, at the end of this process, we end up with just uh, two types of object. The, the white object that are the garbage one, the, the object that are not reachable by our code, and uh, the black object that are uh, the object still alive, the object that uh, your code can uh, still operate on. One thing to the important to this process is that the strong tricolor invariant must hold true. What does it mean? It means that uh, we can have uh, direct pointers from black object to white object. And that is, uh, if you think about it, it's quite simple to explain why. 
because the white objects are considered to be unreachable. But if, I, if my code can reach this object and I have a pointer to reach a black object, uh, to reach, sorry, the white object through the black object, that object cannot be white, simply. So the, this invariant must hold true. Otherwise, our, our garbage collector will end up corrupting our, our memory. Okay, uh, the basic implementation of the mark and sweep uh, that was used in, uh, I mean in the first release of Go and probably by Tiny Go, um, I, I believe, uh, is uh, this one. The collector is, uh, uh, is completely stopping the world. What does it mean, garbage collection, to stop the world? It means that your code, uh, that is the, the mutators in GC jargon, uh, have, um, needs to be stopped to let the collector run. And while the collector is doing the marking phase, uh, your, uh, your application is not doing any progress. Well, this algorithm is uh, easy to implement for sure. Uh, it's, it is very easy to control the growth of the heap because when you reach a certain limit, you can uh, let the garbage collector, the collector run. But unfortunately, we have two problems here. The first one is external fragmentation because uh, when sweep starts to collecting elements from the heap, the heap can bec become quite fragmented. And the way Go tries to mitigate this uh, is using the spans I was talking before. You allocate uh, object based on a fixed size. Uh, but uh, the, the more important problem is, uh, is the latter one because uh, modern memory is limited by not by capacity but by latency. So this is uh, the stop the world latency introduced uh, by the garbage collector to, your, to our application is uh, uh, particularly negative. Okay, so we need to find a way to make the garbage collection concurrently. That is uh, uh, the mean uh, through which uh, we can uh, uh, improve our latency. And uh, since Go 1.5, uh, the, co the garbage collection is effectively, effectively concurrently to, to improve the latency. Uh, and uh, if you think about the algorithm, uh, the sweeping part uh, is, uh, is not so, so dangerous uh, because uh, when we sweep the objects that are not reachable, clearly our, the, the mutator code can access those objects. So it is safe to, uh, to sweep them concurrently. The problem is the marking phase. Let's see why. Okay, uh, suppose that uh, at a certain point of the execution, this is uh, the, the status of your memory. Here, here we have the growth stack, here we have, uh, we have the heap, and uh, the garbage collector is marking our objects with the tricolor using the tricolor abstraction, and at the same time, our code is ex executing this, specifically this. So, uh, if I execute this couple of instructions, uh, we will end up like this. What is the problem here? A black object is pointing to a white object. So at the end of the marking phase, this object will be reclaimed. In other words, uh, if we don't uh, make something, uh, the tricolor invariance does not hold true anymore with concurrent marking. So what can we do to avoid, uh, uh, to avoid uh, ending up in this way, to guarantee the correctness of our garbage collection? What we can do is to make the compiler uh, emit uh, something different from normal uh, pointer operation. Mm, basically, we can uh, operate on uh, uh, point pointer storage, pointer read, and so on. Uh, instead of doing this, uh, we do uh, a, a some form of barrier. Uh, you can think of the barrier like uh, a function that, uh, besides storing the point pointer, like in this case, is able to inform the collector that our mutator code is concurrently modifying the heap, the heap object graph. Okay, uh, the first barrier used by Go, uh, from Go 1.5 to Go 1.7, as far as I know, is uh, this kind of barrier. Is a, first of all, is a write barrier. We, we can have a write barrier or read barrier, but uh, think a little bit about typical non-contiguous data structures like uh, linked lists, uh, trees, uh, and now think about the common operation on them. Insert, remove, uh, find, uh, something like that. And uh, you'll soon realize that uh, the number of pointer reads are far greater than, uh, than, than is far greater than the number of pointer writes. So uh, intuitively, it is cheaper to use a write barrier. We we are imposing less over to our application, and this kind of barrier uh, works like this. When uh, I want where uh, when the, the collector is running and is marking, instead of doing uh, a simple uh, a simple pointer write, instead I do this. So. Uh, if we consider the example from before, if we try to move this pointer, the barrier now will shade the object, uh, preserving the invariant. 
This barrier uh, uh, ensures the strata color invariant, so give us uh, the, the, uh, the, the correctness of our garbage collection, and also ensure forward progress, because uh, uh, it helps us to mark an object and to, uh, toward the end of the marking. Uh, so uh, it ensures forward progress, but has, uh, unfortunately, a great, uh, a, a, a noticeable uh, da downside. Uh, there are, uh, mm, if you think about the uh, address for heap allocated objects that are stored on the GoRoutine stack, uh, clearly even those kind of objects need to be protected in some way. But uh, if we recall uh, from, from the start of the talk, uh, we, we said that uh, normal, uh, usually Google application has a lot of GoRoutine and so a lot of GoRoutine stacks. So in, uh, uh, the using a, st a, a stack, a stack write barrier uh, is too, too complicated for, uh, uh, it, it uh, give us too overhead uh, to our application. So it, it is not feasible. Uh, that's why uh, in the Goran time, uh, until 1.7, uh, they used the permagray stacks. W what does it mean? It means that uh, when the marking phase starts, you can concurrently scan the stacks, uh, but at the end of the marking phase, uh, if the stack is changed, uh, since it is not protected by a barrier, you need to rescan all the stack. Unfortunately, uh, this is uh, uh, not good for latency because uh, here is the scheme of uh, what your mutator code and uh, the garbage collector is doing. Uh, you, you realize that uh, during, the mark during uh, the mark termination phase, uh, uh, since we have to uh, rescan all the stacks, uh, uh, this operation is potentially unbounded we because we don't know how much GoRoutine stacks uh, we have and uh, we, we can have a lot of them. So uh, again, we are in a situation of unbounded latency. That's why uh, in Go 1.8, uh, the Go team introduced this hybrid write barrier. Uh, the hybrid write barrier is a combination of the barrier we saw before, the Dijkstra style uh, write barrier that requires uh, stack rescanning at the end of marking, and another barrier famous in GC theory, the UASA style barrier. And uh, apart from the, the details, uh, thi this barrier uh, requires uh, a snapshot at the beginning of, beginning of the marking phase. This hybrid write barrier introduced by the Go team uh, is particular because it uh, gets the best from the both world. It allows you to concurrently marking the stack uh, without a specific barrier for them, but, uh, uh, and you can do that without rescanning. Okay, so uh, just a couple of examples uh, to, 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 to understand how this barrier works. Uh, here uh, uh, we, have, we are in this situation, we have the, this object that is already marked black in the GoRoutine stack, probably because this, uh, this, uh, this stack uh, has already been scanned. And here we have uh, two, 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 ob two objects and uh, the garbage collector still hasn't marked this one. During this, our mutator code tried to ex execute this. The first, uh, the first instruction here, since it's working with uh, a pointer allocated on the stack uh, that is not protected, is not doing anything. But this one uh, kicks the barrier in. So the, the here we have the right barrier and, and uh, we are ex executing this. So this is the results. In other way, uh, we are... Uh, we are avoiding that the, 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 muta the mutator here is trying to uh, hiding the object, the sole pointer to, to that object, uh, to a black object inside the GoRoutine stack. And this way we are uh, uh, blocking this operation. We are uh, um, not blocking, but where we are guaranteeing the, uh, the tricolor invariant, uh, even in this case. Another example for this barrier, this is uh, like a similar example, but another case. Okay, here is the first instruction when I try to move uh, the sole pointer to the C object that is white uh, from A to a black object in the heap that has already been completely scanned from the collector. Here is what is happened. And uh, again, uh, the right barrier is guaranteeing us uh, the correctness uh, of the garbage collection. For, uh, the arbitrary right barrier is quite complicated. Uh, the Go team has released a paper about uh, the correctness of this. Uh, also, uh, this can, it can be proved that this barrier does not hold the strong tricolor invariant, but uh, it holds the weak tricolor invariant. But these are uh, details that we won't, uh, we won't see here. The, what, what, uh, what we want to see is, uh, uh, what we want to guarantee is that this barrier is ensuring the correctness of our collection. Okay, you can, uh, you can think about the barrier as uh, the performance critical path uh, of your garbage collection. So, despite having a, uh, a really efficient write barrier, in Go 110, the Go team decided to optimize it even more. Algorithmically, the write barrier is the same as before, there are no changes. 
more or less, but uh, uh, what has been introduced is a, a, a buffered write barrier. So now we have uh, a each, uh, each logical processor P has uh, a buffer where it can store uh, the, uh, the, the pointers to be to the, 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 that has to be shaded du during the marking phase. This is the first part of, of the barrier since uh, if this buffer is not, uh, is not full, I can simply enqueue the, the, the pointers here and then uh, I can go on with my execution, even if uh, we are in the middle of a marking phase and we are executing concurrently. Besides, th this uh, fast path is really fast <laughs> because uh, the barrier is implemented in assembly and uh, uh, there is uh, a nice optimization. The function call is not a normal Go function call. Uh, we, just save, we just save and restore uh, just to register in the slow path. So it is very, very fast. It is not a normal function call. When the buffer is full, uh, then uh, we have to rely on the slow path, uh, so the buffer has to be flushed, uh, and all the objects need to be uh, grayed uh, just as before. Okay, uh, we've talked a lot about the barriers. Uh, let's focus uh, again on the marking phase. Uh, Go, Go Garbage Collector dedicates 25% uh, of your CPUs uh, to background marking. Uh, Mean th that means that, uh, uh, for, uh, as an example, this machine has eight, eight cores, uh, so uh, we can have uh, uh, we we have uh, two uh, two CPUs that are concurrently doing garbage collection. Since there are more CPUs that are doing concurrently uh, concurrently garbage collection, uh, to reduce uh, uh, the contention, uh, the Go runtime implemented this uh, distributed work pool. So we have a global work pool, work pool where uh, we store all the pointers that need to be that, that needs to be shaded and also we have uh, uh, a local uh, work work pool for each uh, p virtual processor when we talk about gray object in the runtime a gray object is simply an object that that uh, is marked it is uh, on one of these work queue the global one or the or one of the local one a black object is an object that uh, is has already been marked uh, it is uh, already outside of one of that queue okay we said that go uh, dedicate 25% of the CPUs to background marking. So you can uh, easily imagine that uh, if your others go routine that are executing uh, in parallel are allocating heavily, we risk to uh, go over the heap size goal. We risk, uh, uh, we risk an out of memory error again because our mutator is, is executing concurrently to a garbage collector. To avoid this, uh, go introduce the mark assist mechanisms. Uh, specifically, this mechanism is uh, a kind of, kind of a budget system where uh, a go routine that is making marking work is earning credits. When uh, a go routine needs to allocate, it, uh, the allocation is charged based uh, based on the size of the allocations. And when a go routine uh, uh, exhausts its buffer, uh, its budget, sorry, simply tries uh, to steal allocation credits from the from the background marking go routines. But uh, if they are, uh, the, the credits is not enough. Uh, then it is forced to assist. And this is crucial because uh, this is uh, the, the mean uh, through which uh, the collector slow down uh, the, the go routine that is allocating too heavily. Okay, uh, again, we said that the marking process is a distributed algorithm, is a distributed process, so we need a distributed algorithm even to, uh, to check uh, when uh, the mark is going to terminate. In Go 112, the mark termination uh, algorithm has been rewritten and simplified. And uh, we use, uh, as, as I said, the distributed mark completion algorithm. And uh, this, is the, the, this is what, uh, what is happening. When, uh, a, uh, a P, when a processor P reaches uh, a background mark completion point, that is, uh, it, uh, it checks that uh, it has no more local work to do, it tries to start a mark termination phase. To do that, uh, it acquires a semaphore since uh, only one P needs to execute this algorithm. Then it check the global work we've, we've seen before to be sure that uh, there is no global marking work to do. And after that, uh, for each uh, other processor, e, uh, it forces them to, to flush all the local work from the, the right barrier buffer and, and from the local GC work queue. And then uh, it checks the flags. Uh, if, uh, if no work has been flushed, uh, then uh, this means that uh, the work is, uh, is uh, really completed and uh, so we can start a mark termination phase. But uh, if you think about this, uh, this algorithm can fail repeatedly to enter the mark termination phase. But this is not uh, uh, time wasted because uh, through, this, uh, through this algorithm, uh, 
the load uh, between the various uh, pool uh, are rebalanced because all the work uh, is moved to the global queue. So th even uh, the mark termination algorithm is quite, uh, quite, quite is, is really nice uh, in my opinion. Okay, uh, here we can uh, sum up all the phases of the garbage collection and uh, the important point here, you can see the marking phase, uh, and uh, the, the important point here is that uh, the two stop the world, uh, stop the world pauses now uh, are there uh, primarily to enable or disable the right barrier we talked about and the mark assist mechanisms. And uh, the nice thing to, to, to say now is that uh, the, the, the length of the marking phase, uh, sorry, the length of the stop the world pauses uh, is not proportional to the size of the heap anymore. So this is a really a uh, great difference uh, uh, mm, mm, compared to stop the world garbage collector. Okay, uh, so now we know how, uh, how the GoGC cycle is, is uh, constructed, but uh, we have to know when to start the, our collection. And uh, maybe uh, many of you know this uh, GoGC environment variable, and that variable is, is uh, used to set the heap goal for the next collection. So starting from the end of a collection, I end up with uh, uh, the size of the live heap, and uh, through this formula, I can calculate the goal uh, for uh, the next collection. And uh, by default, GoGC is 100, and this means that uh, the next collection we start when the, we start uh, will uh, uh, will make so that uh, uh, the size of the heap uh, won't exceed the twice the size of the live heap. Okay, now just come back for a minute at uh, at the stop the world mark and sweep. When to uh, may uh, to to to, to set the trigger for the next collection in this uh, scenario. It is very simple because if I know the heap size goal, when I reach the heap size goal, I can simply stop my program and let the garbage collectors kick in and uh, reclaim memory. Unfortunately, we are doing concurrent mark, uh, mark and sweep garbage collection. And this means that uh, when uh, our uh, garbage collector is marking, as we saw, our go routines are still allocating memory. So, if I set the, uh, the trigger here at the deep size goal, uh, I, I will end up uh, uh, with uh, uh, an effective size too, too, uh, uh, too big and the risk an out of memory error. The GC pacer uh, is the part of the garbage collection that tries to decide where to set this heap size trigger. And uh, it tries to optimize uh, based on two different metrics. The first one is the effective heap size, that is the size of the heap uh, after the marking phase, at the end of the marking phase, sorry, and the heap size goal, that is the goal uh, we calculated uh, at the end of the, first, uh, uh, in the previous collection. And what we want is to minimize uh, this, uh, this space uh, because uh, clearly we don't want to go over, but we don't want, want to go to, to fall too shortly because uh, if uh, every time I do a garbage collection, there is a, a lot of, the space is big, uh, that means that uh, I'm doing garbage collection too frequently or, the, uh, the, in other words, the CPU utilization uh, of the garbage collector is too high. Besides, uh, uh, as I said, uh, uh, Go has a target of 25% uh, of CPUs for background marking, uh, and uh, if, uh, I'm if the garbage collector uses... Uh, uh, if, the ship, if, the, if the CPU utilization of the garbage collector is too low, that means that uh, the, the length of the marking phase will be higher, and then the write barrier will be on for, um, for more time, and the, the mark assist will be on for more time. That is means that uh, we, we, we don't want to impact the throughput too much. Okay, uh, now let's talk a little bit about the sweep phase. Uh, for each span, uh, Go has uh, uh, metadata uh, describing each span, and specifically we, we are interested in these uh, two fields. Alloc bits is uh, a bitmap uh, that uh, say to us uh, if an object is allocated or not in a span. And uh, GC mark bits uh, is a bitmap that uh, tells us uh, if an object has been marked or not. What does it mean to sweep a span? It is quite simple because uh, at the end of the marking phase, uh, uh, the objects that are alive are the ones that are marked. So sweep a span simply means uh, uh, al mm, assigning the value of uh, the GC mark bits bitmap to alloc bits. It is, it is very simple. Clearly, GC mark bits uh, is uh, set to uh, a buffer all initialized to zero. So, sweep span is very fast. It is, uh, the, the impact of this is, is negligible. The problem is that uh, sweeping modifies the span metadata, and so it must be completed before the next marking phase uh, starts. 
uh, to be sure that uh, uh, apart from forced garbage, co garbage collection, but uh, apart from that, uh, to be sure that the next garbage collection will start uh, with all the span sweeped, Go uses a mechanism that is uh, very, very similar to the proportional marking we saw. Uh, we have the proportional sweeping, and that, that means that uh, we have a background co and concurrent sweeping. Also, we have uh, uh, the uh, lazy sweeping because when a goroutine uh, tries to allocate, uh, depending on a budget system, it, m it uh, will be forced to sweep some spans. And uh, uh, this is also the job of the, of the GC pacer, and uh, th the sweeping rate is decided by the, G by the GC pacer, judging by the number of uh, sweepable pages and all the distance between uh, the live heap at the end of the previous collection and the heap trigger that we set before. Okay, so now that we have uh, uh, hopefully a clearer view of the Go garbage collection, let's see, uh, let's talk uh, briefly about the impact, the performance impact uh, on our application. Okay, uh, this is uh, uh, the, the, the final schema of Go garbage collection for recent releases of Go, Go 1.12, Go 1.13. And uh, here you, ca you can, to summarize, you, can have, uh, you have uh, two stop the world poses uh, here at the beginning, at the end of the marking phase. Then we have 25% uh, of the CPUs dedicated to background marking. You can have mark assist here if your go routine is allocating heavily during the marking phase. And uh, you have to remember that the right barrier is on during uh, uh, each marking cycle. Here is not enabled. Uh, Plus, we have uh, the sweeping part, but as, as I said, we can, uh, we can uh, just uh, forget about, about the sweeping part. Okay, uh, these uh, are service level objectives for Go garbage collection, and uh, this uh, comes from a presentation from Rick Hudson, that is part of the, of the Go team, uh, a, presenta a keynote uh, of the 2018, and uh, here, uh, I, nice uh, two things to note here is, is this uh, the extension of the stop the world poses they they mm, they worked to make those, po those poses uh, less than 500 uh, microseconds and uh, besides they uh, with the pacing algorithm uh, they wanted to have minimal gc assist in a steady state uh, when your application is in steady state so the, the the pacing algorithm is able to minimize the need to uh, to force the goroutines to make him mark, mark assist when your application is in a steady state. Uh, okay, here you can see uh, just a, a quick, uh, quick benchmark I executed on this machine, on my machine. The, the ga garbage uh, here the is, is a benchmark specifically designed to stress the garbage collector, the go garbage collector. And uh, as you can see, even on this machine, uh, the stop the world poses are of the order of tens of microseconds. And so, well, kudos to the Go team uh, for this. <laughs> okay, we said that uh, doing concurrent mark and sweep, uh, we, uh, we have uh, a great improvement in latency, but we, uh, we have uh, an impact uh, in throughput. We already know about uh, the write barrier, we already know about uh, the mark assist mechanism, but uh, what else uh, we, we have to say is uh, the floating garbage problem. Okay, now let's picture that the situation of the heap is, is this one. We have uh, just two objects, A has already been marked black, and B has already been marked gray. But the marking phase is not terminated, there are uh, other parts of the memory graph, so at some point, uh, before the, the, the end of the marking phase, your mutator code is uh, deleting this pointer. So this is the situation, and uh, at the end of the marking phase, B will be marked as black, even if it is unreachable. What does it mean? This means that uh, B, despite being garbage, uh, is marked as reachable. So this is uh, what uh, in GC theory is called floating garbage. Uh, this is not a correctness problem. The problem is that uh, uh, bec because this, uh, this, uh, this object uh, will be eventually reclaimed at the next collection, the problem is that uh, we are uh, uh, delaying more work uh, and users work to the next garbage collection. But this is, this is a problem that is inherent to concurrent garbage, garbage collection. Okay, uh, first of all, before, before optimizing, you need to measure, you need to have, uh, you need to have uh, information about your application, and uh, there are uh, a lot of tools uh, to do profiling uh, and so on, to do tracing. In my opinion, one, one tool that is really useful is uh, this, the minimum mutator utilization curve. And uh, you can get this for your application using the tracer. It is, I think, the last, last voice in, uh, in the tracer and in all of the tracer options. And uh, this is particularly interesting because uh, 
uh, here, uh, here you can have a graph uh, to measure the utilization of the mutator, so your application code, uh, in a specified uh, span of times. And also here you have uh, immediately, immediately you can say that uh, the, the, the y-intercept here is uh, equal to the CPU time spent in the mutator. So the, the lower it is and the lower the CPU time spent in your code uh, is. Besides, uh, this the, the, the x-intercept is equal to the maximum pose uh, due, to the garbage, due to garbage collection. So this graph is able to give you an immediate, uh, an immediate information if your GC is experiencing and you see pressure. Clearly, if, if this line is uh, close to the X graph and is, and is uh, moved to the right, uh, is worse, uh, or uh, in, in, other, in other words, uh, uh, needs uh, uh, to, mm, to be uh, improved from a point of view of memory allocation and garbage collection, if is it possible, clearly. Another tool that you can use uh, to have uh, specific information about every single garbage collection cycle is uh, the trace uh, that can you, you can habilitate uh, with, with this, uh, we go the bug. Uh, this one is able, you can, you, you can uh, get this uh, even in production, this I think no. But here uh, you can have detailed information about uh, the poses we, sto we, we, we talked before and also about uh, the, the, the decision of the GC pacing regarding the goal for the next collection. And uh, this format is uh, described uh, thoroughly in, uh, in the runtime package uh, documentation. Okay, to optimize your application, to say, to say that just uh, very, very briefly, what you need to do, if we manage to have less allocations on the heap, we will end up with less marking work, that is shorter GC cycle, and finally, the right barrier will be on for less time, we will have less mark assist and uh, also less floating garbage, as we saw. So this is uh, what you tend to do, lowering uh, the, the, al the allocation rate. To do that, uh, uh, first keep in mind that the scanning time of the heap uh, is, uh, is more or less linear in the number of pointers scanned. So what you really need to do is uh, trying to, to, limit, uh, to limit the use of pointers. Uh, first of all, you can use, uh, you can use escape analysis uh, and profiling too, to ask the compiler where it is uh, allocating and why. For example, uh, if you use uh, uh, interfaces, uh, uh, if you don't uh, set the initial size uh, of, uh, of, uh, uh, of a slice that don't need to be reallocated, probably will end up allocating on the heap. Also, on the, at least uh, at first, you should prefer copying values instead of passing a pointer. Here, uh, from, from those of you who come from C++ or C, you know that using pointers may help you in performance. In Go, this is not, uh, this is not, this is not true, at least uh, for the majority of the case. Besides, you can consider refactoring to avoid pointers in your type. As an example, suppose that you identified the performance critical path of your application, and in that path, you are doing a little bit of logging. You want to log uh, uh, a timestamp to, to know about the time of, the, of that operation. If you use uh, the time struct, uh, you have to know that this, uh, there is a pointer inside for localization. So it is better not to do so if you are really caring uh, about the performance because uh, you, are, uh, you will end up allocating more on the heap and uh, giving more work to do to the garbage collector. So what you can do in this case, as an example, is uh, substituting the timestamp with, uh, uh, I don't know, an int 64 timestamp and then converting it, uh, converting it when you need to read it. Uh, okay, what, what if your application uh, uh, is allocating a lot of objects of the same size, of the same type? In that case, uh, it may be useful to reuse memory and you can do that uh, with sync.pool. Well, sync.pool may not be so friendly to use, but uh, uh, it has been also it has it also uh, it has been updated in Go 113, and uh, before that, uh, at each collection, all the object that stays in a pool uh, would be reclaimed. Instead, with the new mechanism, uh, first the objects that are in the pool when the garbage collector kicks in are moved in a victim cache, but are kept there, and uh, at the next garbage collection cycle, they are reclaimed. In other words, this is, uh, uh, this is a way to reduce your allocation if you are reusing a lot of objects. Okay, if you, uh, you try to lower your, your uh, uh, allocation rate on the heap and uh, you're, you, you did your best, what else can you do? Well, GoGC has just one knob, GoGC, and uh, here we, can, we reclaim the formula for the calculation of the heap goal for the next collection. 
you can try to tune GoGC uh, value. What does it mean to increase the GoGC value? Increasing the GoGC value means to trading memory to give better CPU utilization. And you can do that even, uh, even at the uh, runtime. Uh, uh, and uh, you can do that uh, to, uh, to try to respond to the modifying needs of your application. Maybe you have a spike or maybe your application is changing from one phase to another and that needs more memory. And so you can try to do that. There are some, some details, but anyway, you can try. And uh, the, the thing that uh, you have to, to, to keep in mind is that uh, when you have high values of GoGC, it, is really, is really, it becomes harder to control uh, the growth of the heap. This because uh, here you have this image, GoGC equal 100, means that uh, uh, my collection will, uh, will set the goal at the double of the, of the live size, but uh, here uh, the goal is there. What does it mean? That if I am in steady state, uh, there is no problem because uh, when the, co when the collector kicks in, I'll return this. But is at a certain moment, uh, the life size of my heap is uh, a little bit higher. We are amplifying that difference uh, by a factor of three. And so uh, the, pacer, the pacer can end up uh, setting a goal that is uh, too high and uh, we, we can have problem of auto memory errors. So uh, sometimes what you want to do is not uh, mm, uh, saying something about uh, the the heap grow ratio, you want to s to to communicate to the garbage collector a certain value for the heap. Just like to say, okay, uh, you can uh, you can uh, uh, you can stay still. <laughs> okay, you can uh, reduce uh, the the garbage collection rate, but. Uh, uh, what you have to do is uh, garbage is uh, starts to kick in more frequently if we are closer to that limit. Currently, this is not possible as far as I know, uh, but uh, in the future, we, I think that in maybe in the closer future, we will end up with that kind of uh, this API here to inform the garbage collector that we want to, to allocate, uh, we have uh, that much room for, for the heap to expand. And this will be particularly useful for that kind of application that has a small live heap, but uh, an, uh, a very high allocation rate. So despite optimizing, you, will, you, still, uh, you still have a high allocation rate. At, uh, in that case, uh, this, API, this API should be very useful. Luckily, uh, this, uh, this, is not, uh, uh, this is not landed in uh, the main code. Uh, but uh, I think that uh, here you can, you can follow the discussion about that, and uh, probably in the next release, uh, we can have also this kind of uh, API. So. Uh, <laughs> This is uh, all about uh, Go Garbage Collection, so <laughs> at least for my talk. Thank you. Uh, so sorry. Like using anything in the runtime package is actually like an implementation detail of the current Go language. So is it smart to rely on using anything from it? Yeah, OK. Uh, clearly, uh, uh, um, here I'm talking about uh, performance improvement. Uh, and uh, when you, uh, we, um, we are not talking about writing a pneumatic code. So uh, clearly, at a certain point, when you, get the, when you, when you need to get the most of the more performance out of your application, you need to take some risks. So cle clearly, it is better to let uh, the garbage collector uh, do its work. And, and I have to say that for the majority of the case, the garbage collector, thanks to the pacing algorithm, works very, very well. But for some specific cases, just like mm, I said, there are some mm, uh, there are some tweaks that need to be made. So it is uh, it is up to you. Uh, you have to decide yourself for your specific case uh, if you want to rely on implementation detail. Or maybe another way, since Go is open source, you can uh, present your problem to the Go team, you can discuss with them, and uh, if uh, uh, your problem is real, they, uh, they, I think they will end up helping you, uh, even wi with the modification of the runtime, because if you, the, all the modification I presented, as you see, I present a little bit of history of the garbage collector, and uh, uh, have been uh, uh, in place uh, due to, uh, to, to answer certain needs. So that's all uh, you can do, I think. Other question? So the question is, uh, uh, what are the symptoms 
uh, of uh, an application that suffers from allocated into memory. I mean, how do I detect that it's slow because of that and not because of my a, co a problem in my code? Well, for example, one of the symptoms uh, is uh, at least in, in certain uh, in certain moments uh, you can experience uh, a delay in uh, uh, a delay in, uh, in answering certain requests, or at least uh, you can observe. Uh, a, a steady level of uh, of uh, of responses from your application at a certain point uh, you you cannot you cannot that uh, something is not going because uh, you see uh, a degradation in that uh, in, in the quality of service and in that case uh, uh, you have to start profiling and so the minimum mutated utilization curve uh, can help you to understand if uh, if the there there is a memory allocation problem so this is uh, i think uh, one of the symptoms Welcome. Any other question? Uh, hello. First, hello. Uh, good presentation. Yeah, and uh, I will connect to the previous question. Can you explain more about profiling? Because I come from Java world, we create heap dump and okay. analyze, analyze yeah. it later. Is there any similar? Yeah, uh, in profiling, uh, one of the instruments that uh, to me is very, is very useful uh, uh, you can, uh, uh, one of the views that are uh, available uh, is a uh, views that allows you to, uh, to see the, the quantity of uh, heap allocated objects uh, uh, alongside each instruction of your program. And uh, you, you can do profiling even, uh, even for, uh, for, uh, for, uh, for web servers if for in production. So you have, uh, uh, when you import an at HTTP, uh, you, have, uh, uh, you automatically expose an endpoint, uh, if I can recall well, and uh, you can interrogate that endpoint and get the, all, the, all the profiles data. Then uh, you can run uh, GoTool, PPROF uh, with, with all that data. And uh, the source view, uh, allows you to view uh, for, for each uh, instruction of your Go program, you have uh, uh, the quantity, the cumulative uh, quantity of memory you are locating on the heap. So sometimes uh, this, is, uh, this is really useful because uh, uh, you realize immediately that uh, you are locating uh, a lot of memory. Typical example is, uh, you know, a slice that is uh, reallocating uh, because it's doubling its, its uh, underlying buffer and uh, so you end up allocating a lot. So in that case, uh, you should verify if uh, it is possible to change your program so to, uh, to know in advance uh, the, the maximum si size of that slice uh, or to try to allocate uh, uh, an initial buffer to avoid at least uh, the first part of the allocations. So. Prof profiling a tool is a, is a tool uh, that is very extensive, uh, and, uh, but that is one of the things that, uh, uh, in my opinion, is very useful. So, uh, so you suggested passing the data instead of pointer. Uh, sorry? So you suggested passing the data, copying the data instead of passing the pointer. No, sorry, I, I don't know. <laughs> okay. So you suggested like uh, we should pass the data okay. instead of cop uh, we should copy the data instead of passing the pointer. Okay. Like, uh, won't it affect the performance? What did the, sorry? Will it not affect the performance? Ah, like yes, uh, yes, yes, away? okay. The, the, uh, the point is this. Bill Kennedy explained that very well. Uh, if you come from uh, other languages like C and C++, uh, normally what you do is uh, moving pointer and avoiding uh, the copy of a struct uh, is, the, is the best thing to do regarding performance. In Go, this is not, uh, this is not true in all the cases. What you should do is uh, thinking about the semantics of your code. So if you need uh, to modify the internal state of a struct, then you need a pointer, a pointer receiver. Otherwise, uh, at first it should stick to a value receiver. First, uh, this is uh, the, the idiomatic way of writing your code. And besides, uh, this also can help uh, uh, regarding Go Garbage Collector. Because uh, if you have less pointer, you will end up allocating less, mm, less on the heap. Uh, and the marking phase uh, will be shorter with all the benefits we talked about. I mean, y using the point pointer shouldn't affect the escape analysis, actually. No, but uh, okay. But uh, if you can avoid, uh, if you can avoid uh, a pointer in uh, in the in the struct, the, the uh, scanning of the heap should. Uh, but the, the idea is not to have it in the struct. You're just passing pointer into a function, yeah. so that you don't have a copy. You you don't need to have a copy inside of the function. You can yeah, you I know, but it, it depends of uh, pointer to the to the element which is allocated on the stack. 
Yeah, if it is located on a stack, there is no problem. Clearly, we are talking about uh, objects located on. Yep, it it depends. Uh, it depends on the case. Yeah. I think so. Any other question? Okay, just a reminder that the the wardrobe service closes at six p.m. and there will be the go for dinner at eight p.m. at the Obika. Thank you all.